What is up, you beautiful happy hustlers out there? Kerry Jack here, and I hope that you are crushing the day. I mean it, just making the most of this very moment right here and right now, baby. And in this episode of the Happy Hustle Podcast, we have on Mr. Anton Gunn, who is a former senior advisor to President Barack Obama and the world's leading authority on socially conscious leadership. He has a master's degree in social work from USC and was a resident fellow at Harvard. He is the best-selling author of The Presidential Principles and just an all-around stand-up guy. He really rocked the mic in this episode, and we talk all about leadership, how to become more socially conscious, how to really happy hustle in your workplace and in include diversity top of mind and you know, Anton's just a really great human. We connected recently in North Carolina when we were both keynote speaking at a uh, Market Movers conference, and we just hit it off, and I wanted to rock the mic with him and share him with you guys. So without further ado, let's dive into this episode of the Happy Hustle Podcast. And real quick, guys, I just want to give a huge shout out to this episode's sponsor, Newtopia, who is making the World Domination Box, nine different proprietary nootropic formulas that are helping you optimize your cognitive performance, boost creativity, and mental clarity. If you guys want to check it out, you can go to newtopia.com forward slash happy hustle, get yourself the hookup, and best part, it's got a money back guarantee, baby, so you got nothing to lose and everything to gain. Now let's dive in back to this episode. All right, Anton Gunn, welcome to the Happy Hustle Podcast, my brother. I am super stoked to connect. Happy to be here, man. Excited to be with you. Yeah, man, this, this is going to be a fun one. And you know what? I got the privilege to meet you in person. And we connected at the um, Market Movers in North Carolina. It was a, a conference Anton and myself were uh, speaking at. And, you know, we just hit it off. We went to dinner together and I got to see, you know, your, your heart and, and, you know, your soul and your expertise live and in person. And I was blown away by the man you are. And I really was excited to share you with the happy hustlers out there. I mean, you, you have so many accolades, like, first of all, you were a senior advisor to president Barack Obama, which that's amazing. You know, I'm excited to dive into that. You're also like a leading authority on the social conscious leadership and that whole structure. You know, you have a master's in, in social work and, and a resident fellow at Harvard and you're an international keynote speaker and so many topics. But before we get into all that good stuff, Anton, tell me something interesting about yourself that not too many people know. Something interesting that people don't know. First of all, there's a lot of things and I'm grateful for the opportunity. I was so glad to meet you at the conference. Uh, I'm, yeah. a, um, I'm, a, I'm a renaissance kind of guy. So uh, I'm going to give you two things just because they're quick and easy. The first thing is um, I'm a huge NASCAR fan and most people have no idea that I love racing the way that I do. And I've never yeah. like, been behind a car, behind the wheel of a car to race but I love sitting in the pit. And so um, I've, I've been in the pit for Wood Brothers Racing, uh, oh, 21 cool. car forward. I've been hung out with them. Tony Stewart is my guy. I'm a Tony Stewart fan through and through. Nice. Uh, old school Mark Martin fan. So, so racing is, is something that I like. NASCAR racing is something I love. The second thing that I'll give you, and I told you this when we met, but I, I actually am a big time movie guy. And I actually write treatments and screenplays. And that's something that I do mm -hmm. as a hobby and for, for fun. And a lot of people don't know that about me. Yeah, those are two really awesome, interesting facts. And I definitely want to talk to you more and more um, about your screenplays and, and how I could potentially connect you with some people there and, uh, or just like, you know, be in one of your movies uh, in the future. Uh, <laughs> I would but, love it, man. Yeah, it'll be fun. We'll, we'll talk about that. But, you know, I want to start things off with like this amazing transformation. You know, you went from playing college, you know, football, you were an offensive lineman for, you know, South Carolina, which is SEC, arguably the toughest, you know, conference in the entire country or world to then going into politics, you know, and, and to like, wearing the fancy suit and tie and shaking hands and kissing babies. Like tell us kind of that transformation and just give us a little backstory on you. Yeah. So um, the backstory is the most important story, man. You know, um, I didn't, I didn't come from a, a, a life of privilege or anything. And I was grateful to play college football. I'm the only one of my siblings to actually have a college degree. 
And, uh, and so I was grateful for the opportunity, but the, the hard part about football, man, is that um, I actually uh, hated it the most of the time that I was in school because it was just mm -hmm. kind of punishing physically. And I had coaches that weren't good. They were verbally abusive. Mm -hmm. And so I quit playing college football after three and a half years. I got my degree in three and a half years and then I decided I didn't want to play. But when I made that decision, you know, everybody, including my girlfriend at the time and everybody told me I was stupid because I didn't have a plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I found myself 12 months later with a college degree, sleeping back in my parents' house, back into my old room that I was in when I was in high school, uh, crying myself to sleep at night because I couldn't figure out why I wasn't doing better than what I was doing. I had a college degree. I was at this big school, SEC football, all of these lessons that they all teach you about sports and, and life. But here I am living at home in my mom and dad's house crying myself to sleep because I didn't have a job. I didn't have a car. I had, you know, basically I worked at a temp agency making $138 a week. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt like I should be doing more, but I didn't have a path. I didn't, um, didn't know where to go. Mm -hmm. And a guy named Pete Rambo, who was in network marketing with a company called Amway, gave me this cassette tape of this guy named Les Brown. And we all know oh, Les nice. Brown is like a hall yeah. of fame, motivational speaker, yeah. extraordinaire, right? This, this tape just kind of spoke to me like I should be doing more, that I should find my passion and fulfill it. And it was like a week later, I got a call from a college fraternity brother who says, send me your resume. I think I got a job for you. Mm. And the job was at a small nonprofit whose mission was focused on helping poor people get access to healthcare coverage and all kinds of other things. Next thing I know, I was packing up an uh, old 1984 beat up Buick Saber with no nice. air conditioning, driving six hours back to South Carolina <laughs> to beg this lady for this job. Mm. And she gave me this job and it opened my entire mind to a world that I really didn't know. And that's a world of people who didn't have health insurance coverage, who were on, in poverty, on welfare, who couldn't find a job, homeless issues, senior citizens who didn't have access to care. And I found myself totally sold out, passionate about helping these people get some justice and get a better life. And that kind of led me to meeting politicians who would say the wrong thing or say the right thing, but then do the wrong thing. And mm. it pissed me off when people would say they were going to do the right thing, but wouldn't do it wouldn't yeah. uh, stand up for people who were in need. And I say, well, why am I begging you to do something that you don't have the altruism or the loving or the brotherhood to do? I should just do it myself. And that's mm -hmm. when I decided to run for office. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that I had a you know political backstory or some famous thing. I just got tired of seeing politicians say one thing and do another, particularly as related to low-income families women, people of color, new immigrants that came to America and were trying to do the right thing. And, and they were just being crapped on by the system. And so I sought to change the system. And that's actually what threw me into politics. Wow. I mean, so inspiring, like coming from those humble beginnings to that to see where you are now. And like, it, it's, it's really, you know, the takeaway for me is like, you can be the change you wish to see in yes. the world, like, you know, yes. Gandhi says, and, and then sure, it's a little cliche, and you know, whatnot, but it's so true here, Anton is, you know, he didn't like that the politicians were telling him one thing and doing another. So he's, you know what, I'm going to run, I'm going to be a tough politician, and, and I'm going to make the change happen. And and the happy hustlers, all you out there listening, you guys can make that change happen in your own life. You know, it just starts by taking action, you know, and, and, being passionate enough to persevere past the adversity, because I know there was adversity for you. you so, know? so yeah, let me, let me just tell you, you know, to, to all your listeners, you know, you, you, you got a great show and you've been giving them great value. And what everybody needs to understand, Superman is not going to show up. Yes. True. Batman is not coming. Yeah. Okay. There's Wonder Woman is not showing up around the corner. There's no superhero coming to save you from the life that you don't want. The only person that's gonna save you from the life that you don't want is the person that you look at in the mirror every day. Amen. You have to become the person that you want to be. And it's and that's that's what happened when I listened to that Les Brown tape is that I knew that nobody was coming to pull me out of this. My mom couldn't do it, my dad couldn't do it. There was nobody that's gonna pull me out of this. I had to have the mindset mm. to match up 
with the skill set and the outcomes that I wanted. And mm. I felt like I had the skills, but I didn't have the right mindset at the time. And mm. then when you prepare your mindset, the opportunity will show up to make a difference. And I found my pathway to making a difference. And that's what I've been doing for the better part of 30 years. Yeah. I mean, it, it truly is, you know, it, it might be earth shattering to someone hearing this, but it, it is that simple. No one's saving you. You have to look at yourself in the mirror and save yourself. And if you're not happy with your reality right now, know that your reality is a consequence of your actions or inactions. And so you have to take accountability and, and, you know, and get after it and make a change. So I love that you went there, man. Yeah, so man. let's fast forward. I, I do want to, you know, talk about your political career a little bit more. And of course, I've got to talk about Obama because, you know, you told such an amazing story of how yeah. you came to work with Barack Obama, yeah. President Barack Obama, you know, and it was, it really fueled me, man. Like, I, I love to hear grit stories. Mm -hmm. I love to hear people who, you know, hear no and, and persevere past and say, and get a yes. Yeah. Tell us, you know, kind of how yeah. you started working with President Barack Obama. Yeah, so it's actually kind of right where I just finished off. So I told you I ran for office. Um, but what I didn't tell you is that I lost the first time I ran. for office. <laughs> yeah. So um, I ran against a tough, tough opponent, and I got beat. But when I got beat, I lost by 298 votes. And everybody told me, Anton, you did good, you got close. And I was like, man, clothes don't count. You either win or you lose. And yeah. that's my Ricky Bobby um, paraphrase, <laughs> yeah, yeah, will, yeah. right? Um, and I lost, man. And I, a lot of people wanted me to be depressed about it, but I felt like, man, I, I could have done better. I just wanted to do more. And three months later, I, uh, really two months later, I found myself in Washington, D.C., um, leaving a conference. And I walked past a bookstore and I saw the book on the shelf, The Audacity of Hope. And I heard it, had heard in a meeting people talking about that he's going to run for president. Barack Obama is going to run for president. And he had this book, The Audacity of Hope. And I was like, let me see what this guy is talking about. So I picked up his book and I started reading it in the bookstore. And I fell in love with what he was writing. And I got so immersed in the book, bro, that uh, I missed my flight. <laughs> I literally <laughs> missed my flight. That's so and, uh, and so I bought four <laughs> copies of the book. I got rebooked on another flight and I bought the CDs because this was during the day of CD players. Yeah. I bought the audio version of the book on CD and I listened to it as I read it on my flight on my way back to South Carolina. And when I got back, I went to a holiday party. This was December. And I was with some friends of mine who helped me on my campaign. And I handed the book to them. And they was like, what's this, Anton? I was like, this is a book that we all need to read. And they was like, what do we need to read it for? I said, because I'm actually going to win when I run again. And this is the blueprint we're going to follow. We're going we're gonna to get to know Barack Obama. And they laughed at me. It was like, how in the hell are you going to get to know Barack Obama? You don't know him. And I was like, yeah, I don't know him, but I'm going to just call him on the phone and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to talk to them. And then they laughed hysterically again. You're going to call a United States senator on the phone and talk to him on the phone? I was like, yeah, I'm going to call him. And literally on January the 11th of 20, 2007, I picked up the phone and I called his Senate office. And they said, you know, Senator Barack Obama's office. I said, I want to speak to Barack Obama. And they were, who are you? I was like, I'm Anton Gunn. What part of Illinois do you live in? Because he's an Illinois senator. Yeah. I was like, I don't live in Illinois. I live in South Carolina. And they said, um, you need to call your own U.S. senator. I don't want to <laughs> talk to my U.S. senator. I want to talk to Barack Obama. And they said, well, we'll take a message. What's the message? I said, well, tell him he needs to call me back because I can help him. And they took the message and nobody called me back. Nope. So I called the next day and the same thing happened. Nobody called me back. And then on the third day, I called twice and nobody called me back. And then on the fourth day, I called twice again. And I know at this point in time, they were probably thinking I'm some psychopath calling them on the phone. Nobody called me back. So then this is Friday. I says, okay, let me do something different. So I sent him a long email explaining who I am, what I wanted to do, that I read his book. I was inspired by, I want to help him to run for president. And he needed me involved. And nobody called me back. Nobody responded to my email. So I got pissed. And then I called two more times and nobody <laughs> called me back. And then I decided to do something different. I called his Senate office in Illinois, because everybody's trying to reach him in DC. Let me call Illinois. So I called the office in Chicago and the same thing. They took a message and nobody called me back. 
So then I got pissed off because I've called you like 10 times and you've not returned my phone call. And so I said, what's the most unconventional thing that I could do? So I started thinking about the geography of Illinois. The northern part of the state is more liberal. It's where the Democrats are. It's where they probably get lots of phone calls. But downstate Illinois, the southern part of the state is more conservative, Republican. Mm. So the Democratic senator from Illinois is probably not getting a whole lot of phone calls in that office because they don't want to talk to him. Mm. So I called his office in downstate Illinois. And I literally said, who am I speaking with when the woman answered the phone? And I said, you don't know me, but you need to know me. My name is Anton Gunn and I'm in South Carolina. And I heard Barack Obama's thinking about running for president. Mm. And the primary is coming through our state. And I've called him 10 times and nobody's called me back. So I need you to take this message. If Barack Obama doesn't call me back, I'm going to make sure he effing loses and write my phone number down. 803-361-45. I just laid my phone number out, right? Yeah. And I hung up the phone on it, right? I, love I, it. I ain't got nothing to lose, bro. I mean, like, yeah. I call you 10 times, nothing to lose. Yeah. But I get up, I go get me some water from the water fountain. I'm at work and I come back to my desk. And this is in the era when everybody had a Blackberry and I had a Blackberry. And you know how that red light blinks at the top of yeah. the light. I come back to my desk and I see the red light is blinking on my Blackberry. And I check my missed calls and it says unknown number. I said, who called me from an unknown number? So I checked the voicemail and the voicemail says, Anton, this is U.S. Senator Barack Obama from <laughs> Illinois. I can't wait to meet you. I can't wait to get to know you. We got all of your messages and your email. Call me back when you get a shot. 312-282. Yeah, yeah. Don't tell the so rest. <laughs> I call him right back and we talk on the phone for about five minutes and I can hear him smoking a cigarette through the phone because a lot of people don't remember Barack Obama used to smoke cigarettes. Hmm. And I can hear him smoking through the phone. He says, hey man, I think I'm a run for president and I don't know anything about South Carolina and I need good people on my team. So I'm going to have my campaign manager call you and I want you to talk to them. And the long story short, two weeks later, I was in Washington, D.C., riding with, in a car with Barack Obama, talking about helping him run for president. It was like 48 hours later, they called me back and says, send us your mailing address. We need to send you a Blackberry and a laptop because we want to hire you on his campaign. And that's how I got involved in Barack Obama's campaign to help him to run for president. Oh my gosh. Slow clap, slow clap. I love it. I mean, that story, seriously, one of my favorite stories I've ever heard. <laughs> I mean, it really is. It's, it just reminds me of the grit it takes to be successful, you know, in, in anything though, like, you know, whether you're trying to get your dream job or, you know, you're trying to build your company or you're trying to fill in the blank. You need to have that grit. You have to be persistent and you can't take no for an answer. Correct, man. You know? I, I will tell you, I, it, the average person would probably would have quit after the first two or three phone calls that they made and nobody responded. They would think it's a lost cause, yeah. but for whatever, man, I, I was just like motivated because, you know, I wanted to learn from him. And, and I <laughs> think that's the thing that I, that I take away from it for me more than anything else is it wasn't that it was going to be the best job of my life or it was going to make me a million dollars because I can tell you, I work, you know, 20 hours a day for him for the next 13 months trying to help him get elected to president. And so it was grueling. It put me in the hospital a couple of times, but oh, wow. I learned so much because I got yeah. in proximity with Barack Obama. And I think the thing you got to be mm -hmm. incessantly committed to is the growth process. And every one yeah. of those no's on the phone call was getting me closer to my growth that I needed to be able to achieve many of the things that I'm realizing in my life. So, you know, for all you listening out there, you happy hustlers, if nobody's trying to buy your product, if nobody's interested in your idea, if nobody's, you know, accepting your pitch at the pitch meeting, don't take it, take that as a no right now to the information mm -hmm. that they have right now, mm -hmm. but give them more information and tomorrow you might get a different answer. So don't yep. quit. Yeah, I love that. That's like that Zig Ziglar quote, like, you know, people don't change their mind, you know, uh, from a no to a yes, but they do is they change their decision based on new information. And it's yes. so true, man. Yes, bro. Um, I do want to, you know, kind of talk about your book, you know, yeah. the presidential principles, like, because I know being in proximity yeah. to, you know, 
President Barack Obama, you learned a thing or two <laughs> and sure. you distilled it into this amazing book. Um, yeah. Give us a little bit about like, you know, the, yeah. the basis of why you want to even write it and then kind of, you know, what the book's about. Yeah. So um, I'm going to give you something else factoid that a lot of people don't know mm -hmm. is that Barack Obama is not the only president that I've actually been in close proximity with. Oh, wow. Um, my book is actually based upon my life experience with five U.S. presidents. Oh, wow. Five. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, a lot of people don't know that. Um, the, I, I call them presidential encounters. It's, it's experiences that I had in close proximity to United States presidents. The first one being Vice President Dan Quayle when I was 17 years old. I tell that great story in the book. But I met Bill Clinton. Um, George Herbert, uh, George W. Bush, uh, his mm. whole administration, I was really tied up into them uh, related to my brother. And I'm happy to talk about that at the juncture. Mm -hmm. So what basically what I did with this book is that I really do believe this. If I say the name Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, Kennedy, and Roosevelt, we all know those names as impactful presidents in the United States of America, so much so that all of those men are dead and gone now, but the decisions that they made have had a lasting impact on our lives. Like right now, some of the things that we get to do are based upon the decisions that those presidents made, right? Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking about the last five presidents or the presidents who've been alive in my lifetime and because of my close proximity, what decisions they made that had a lasting impact on my life. And I can tell you that the first decision when George Herbert Walker Bush sent troops into Iraq to fight Saddam Hussein the first time during the first Gulf War was a decision that impacted my life because it took my father overseas at a crucial point when I was trying to decide where I wanted to go to college. Mm. I Literally, the University of South Carolina was not on my radar screen before my father went overseas. Mm. But when he went overseas... I didn't want to go all the way to California to go to college. I decided that I would stay close to home and South Carolina was kind of close to home to where I live. Yeah. So that's just one example. So I wrote this book to talk about you as a leader and the presidential impact that you might have on the people who come in contact with you in your life, the mm. team that you lead. So if you're building a company and you got three employees, the decisions that you make as a leader might have a long lasting impact on the lives of the people that you lead the same way Lincoln had an impact on us, the way Kennedy had an impact yeah. on us. So the book is these essential principles, as I call it, or um, that, that really every leader needs to understand that you have to do if you wanna have that kind of lasting impact that inspires people to action and that they will remember you in a positive light for the rest of their lives. And I can mm -hmm. tell you, Barack Obama is one of those for me, but mm -hmm. I had, I worked for a woman, the woman who gave me the job at that nonprofit mm -hmm. had a monumental impact, but she opened my, my mind to a world that I didn't know. And it shaped the rest of my career. So you yeah. don't have to be a president of the United States. You might just be the president of your household, the yeah. president of your startup company, you know, the president of your team at work. And you can have a lasting impact. So that's what the book is about. And I share some of my vignettes and my encounters with multiple US presidents from Herbert Walker Bush to Bill Clinton to Barack Obama, and yes, even Donald Trump. I had a presidential mm. encounter when I met him on June 18th, uh, 2018 at the White House. So I talk mm. about that as well. Wow, wow. I mean, you guys got to get the book. Where can people go to get the book? You know, give us a link. Yeah, so you can go to presidentialprinciples.com to get the book. Of course, it's available on Amazon, uh, mm -hmm. any other bookseller that you want to get it. But if you want to get it for me directly, I'll even put an autograph on it. If you get it oh, at yeah. presidentialprinciples.com, I'll be happy to send you an autograph copy. Wow. There you go, guys. Check that out. And I got to ask, I mean, give us your funny, funniest or most memorable Obama experience or encounter that you could share. <laughs> I don't think I don't think you have enough time in this show <laughs> for me to tell you um, those great moments, but I'll give you one. OK, yeah, this is a moment where it was like the only time I've ever seen Barack Obama 
like angry, angry, angry. Okay. So he's running for president. So this is, you know, him campaigning for president and it's a grueling lifestyle. Y'all. I mean, when I say grueling, yeah. you know, it's 20 hours a day, no sleep, et cetera. Ugh. So Barack Obama flies into South Carolina and at our meeting, I give him a briefing book. And so it's called a, a daily briefing and it tells him all of the different places that we're going to go in this day for him to do campaign events. It's like nine stops in one oh day. My goodness. And it's all traveling by bus. Now, Barack Obama likes to think ahead. So he's like, okay, tomorrow I know I got to be up at 3 a.m. to get ready to do television in multiple markets. So Anton, you got this schedule laid out for me to be tied up all day. So he's already cranky. He's angry and frustrated. And he's, <laughs> I'm not doing nine events. I'm only going to do six events. And I was like, no, you're doing nine events because we got nine places to go. and We got people waiting on you. Well, so what are we going to cut out tomorrow so I can get some sleep after doing these nine events? And then David Axelrod says, we can't cut out any events tomorrow because you got to be on TV early morning, these shows, because this is how we're going to win in those states. Right. So he's getting angry and angry because everybody is planning his entire life for him. And mm. he can go to the bathroom when he wants to go to the bathroom. Mm. The other part was. He hadn't seen his wife in like two weeks. Oh, so you man. know how a man can get when you love yeah. her. seen her in two weeks, right? Oh, yeah. So the whole day goes, bro, and he is getting more and more snippy and snippy and snippy and snippy. Then there's this big campaign rally event that is late at night at 10 p.m. His schedule was supposed to end at 830. But there's this 10 p.m. event. It's like a party that I want to take him to this party. And if he just mm -hmm. shows up, and they see him there, they're gonna go crazy and everybody's gonna go vote for him the next day, right? And so I tell him, we need to go to this event. It's called Pink Ice. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to no damn Pink Ice. And I'm like, yeah, we gotta <laughs> go, bro, we gotta go, it's gonna be great. He's like, no, I'm not going. So he's literally getting irritated with me every night. So we get to this 8.30 event and his wife is there, Michelle is there at the event. So we surprise him with his wife. So he's thinking at 8.30, I get to go to the hotel and spend the evening with my wife. And I told him, I said, no, we got to go to Pink Ice. And then Michelle says, yeah, we need to go to Pink Ice. And he's like, you <laughs> roped into this too? I can't believe you roped this. So he walking out the door, literally like screaming and yelling about not wanting to go to this event. And then what changes the game is Valerie Jarrett walks over to him and says, Barack, do you want to win? And he looks at her. What you think I've been doing for the last 18 months? You think I don't want to become president? She says, if you want to become president, then you go into pink ice. <laughs> so good. And he drops his head and he gets on the bus and he looks at me and he like glares at me because I got the two most influential women in his life committed to be a part of my agenda and not a part of him wanting to go to bed. So, oh, wow. That, that is that's, hilarious. This is one, one of the many stories of me seeing him, seeing him uh, upset. But he's a great guy, wonderful man, <laughs> loves his family. And uh, I, I was honored to just have the privilege to be able to work with him just for the short time that I did. Yeah, for sure, man. I love that story. I, and it's so funny that it's pink ice, you know, it's like, yeah. it was a sorority event. It's, it's, it's a sorority event. Matter of fact, um, if you oh. actually Google uh, the New York Times magazine and Google Valerie Jarrett, the story about pink ice and the role that she played in there is in the New York Times, the old New York Times issue from about 10 years ago, but a mm. great story for sure. That is funny, man. Well, I do want to transition into your life's work. And, and you know, you, I mean, you've lectured at Harvard University about it. You've spoken at some of the, the biggest companies in the world, mm -hmm. you know, and you have this very unique socially conscious leadership construct yes. that yes. I really want to dive into. I want the happy hustlers yes. to hear it. So break down what that means. So, and, yeah, give us a little yeah, bit so, of, so, about yeah, it. I, so I break it down very quickly. Um, that every one of us knows what it feels like to be treated unfair. We all have experienced some level of unfairness in our lives. So whether we got passed over for a promotion, maybe we got downsized while our coworker who is less productive than we are got to keep their job, uh, or maybe we show up every day to be disrespected or discriminated against by a boss. So in the workplace, these type of injustices happen every day. I mean, just imagine 
mm -hmm. the days that go by and people get mistreated at work. But when mistreatment happens, the vast majority of people, 95% of the people don't do anything about it. They just kind of let it go on. Now, here's the context of, of the social conscious construct is that the longer you are around in an organization or in any place, the more awareness that you have that injustice happens. Like if you're a brand new employee, you don't know all the dirt and all the problems in an organization. Yeah, true. But if you've been there 25 years, you know where every bone is buried in that building. You've seen it five <laughs> yeah. times over, right? Yeah. And because you've been there so long, you have a greater ability to take action and do something about it. So there's this axis of awareness and this axis of action. But most people don't take action and do anything about when they see injustice. Here's why. 50% of us are in a space that I call living in oblivion, mm. which is you have no awareness that stuff is going on. Yep. You have no awareness about what's wrong. So you don't do anything about what you don't know. You can't fix what's wrong if you don't know what's wrong. The example that I like to use is that so many people in America was not aware of the racial injustice that happens to black men at the hands of law enforcement until they saw George Floyd with a knee on his neck for nearly 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Before that, they were unaware. They were completely unaware. Now, I was aware my whole life, but yeah. some people were not aware. And yeah. I can't be mad at you for not knowing. But the point is, 50% of us at any given time is unaware that injustice is happening. Mm. But then you have another 35% of us who are aware that injustice is happening, but they don't do anything about it mm -hmm. because they suffer what I call paralysis by analysis. Mm -hmm. That they see the injustice and they think, oh my God, that problem is so big. There's nothing that I can do about it. That what can little old me do about a, a problem that's big like police violence against black men or racism at work or even climate change? What can little old me do to stop the planet from melting down? I can't do anything. Yeah. So they don't do anything because they think the problem is too big or they make the mistake of saying, that's somebody else's responsibility. It's not my responsibility. Mm -hmm. So they, they don't take action because they don't have the tools, the information and the resources to make a difference. So there you have it. 85% of the people are either living in oblivion or suffering paralysis by analysis. Mm. But then you have the 10%. These are the people who are at the top of the food chain. 10% of the people who have the greatest amount of awareness of injustice and the greatest ability to take action. They're kind of like the, the senior executive at, at an organization. They know everything is screwed up on the inside, mm -hmm. but sometimes they don't do anything other than perpetuate the injustice because they believe that they benefit from it. Mm -hmm. They may believe that they benefit morally, socially, politically, economically, financially. I mean, just think about how many people think that they financially benefit because we got a broken healthcare system in America where so many people stay un uninsured or the people who think they benefit from, you know, all kinds of things is that, Hey, I'm not going to fix this broken system because if I fix this broken system, it's going to put my company out of business or mm -hmm. I'm not going to make as much money. So they're the 10%. I got nicknames for those people. We call them Darth Vader, <laughs> Thanos, um, mm -hmm. Magneto, you know, these are every Eve doctor. No, these are every bad guy that you see in a movie who has all the awareness about the problem and the power and the influence and the money and the resources to make it right. But they don't because they feel like they're going to lose if they do that. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. 95% of people are stuck in the social conscious construct, either living in oblivion, they got paralysis by their analysis or they're objectively oppressive. Mm. But I spend my time teaching you how to become a leader who breaks the social conscious construct and increase your awareness, accelerate your action and make the change that we all want to see in the world. And I call that the 5%. These are the people who operate with justice as their framework, that they never assume that there's nothing that they can't do about something, that they're mm -hmm. going to do something to make it right. And the first thing they're going to do is they're going to raise their awareness by diversifying their relationships, mm. by reading different sources of information, by listening to the Happy Hustle podcast <laughs> and learning more about what they don't know so they can get better at it. Mm -hmm.
The second thing that they do is they say, you know what? I may not have all of the money, all of the power and all of the resources, but there is one thing I can do to make it right. I can try. Yeah. I can take a step. I can make a phone call. I can speak up when I see the injustice happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make that 10% feel absolutely uncomfortable being yeah. okay with perpetuating injustice. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to be doing in the world. And that's what I do every day um, as I try to help organizations build better culture with leaders who are willing to make it right because they break the social conscious construct every day. Mm, man, powerful stuff. I mean, I just want to ask all the happy hustlers out there, where are you guys at? You know, like, think about it when, when Anton's going through that, like, are you living in oblivion? I mean, I know I was at one point and, you know, or are you I got analysis by paralysis or, you know, are you Darth Vader? Yeah. <laughs> Or yeah. in the 5%. I mean, my sister, she is a, a activist like no other. She's a pit bull. Yeah. And she is the 5% with you, man. Sure. I got to connect you because she's a rock star in this oh, world. Yeah. And, you know, she's she's a part of every march. She's, she's out there in the streets yeah. doing all the... I mean, she's a, she's a big time activist. And, you know, it, it really... She challenges me to, yeah. as you said, read different material, learn yeah. from different sources, yeah. you know diversify your your knowledge base and and really start to take accountability too you know like that's yeah. the biggest thing i yes. think you know is take accountability for where you're at right now and then know where you want to go yeah right so so you 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 said uh, said something so the 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 framework that i use i call it the justice code and the third step in the justice code is accountability first step is awareness first of mm -hmm. all and then once you become aware of something, you got to acknowledge that it's real. But then the third step is you got to take accountability for your role in it. And I want mm -hmm. all of the happy hustlers to understand something that I don't care who you are. At some point in your life, you have been either living in oblivion, paralyzed by your analysis or objectively uh, oppressive. We all have like so yeah. as men, I mean, you, you and I are, are two men doing this podcast, right? Yeah. On some gender issues, we probably have been in a for sure. OK, yep. you know, and, and, and when it comes to, you know, like income, I mean, it's, you think about every dimension of your life at some point in time, you're either totally unaware or maybe you're part of the 10 percent that's keeping things the way that they are. And the quest and the journey is is continuing to diversify yourself so mm. you learn and grow every day and get better and become yeah. different because you're getting better. And there's nothing wrong we're getting better and becoming different because it makes you a more effective person. Because I know today, the things that I've learned um, have, have definitely made me more influential and impactful in the lives of other people. And I think that's what our goal is. It's not about money or power, or prestige, but it's about having a lasting impact on every person we have the opportunity to. And so mm. breaking the social conscious construct gives you every opportunity to do that at a greater level. Yeah. Oh, I love it, man. It, it really is about positively impacting others. You know, when it comes down to it, like Tony Robbins says, the secret to living is giving, you know, and, and how can you show up for others, give to others, become a better version of yourself, break the socially conscious construct and, you know, and, and get yourself in the 5%. And, you know, where can people go Anton to like, learn more about your framework? You know, I know you do this, like if they wanted to book you for you know, maybe a speech at their corporation, or if they just want to dive in more to your, your yeah. resources. Great. So this is great. So everybody should go to AntonGunn.com. That's the home of all things. You can read my blog there, watch videos there. You can learn more about me. In addition to that, I'm on all social channels at Anton J. Gunn. So that's LinkedIn, that's Twitter, that's Facebook, and on Instagram. And so those are my four platforms, but I really want to connect with you on LinkedIn because that's where business gets done. So if I can help you in mm -hmm. any kind of way, Anton J. Gunn is where you can find me on, on the social platforms. But AntonGun.com is the home where all things I add value to. So happy, happy to have you there. Oh, man. Yeah, definitely, guys. Check out AntonGun.com. Uh, and I know, um, you know, the presidential principles would be a great read for all the happy hustlers out there. And I wish, you know, we had more time to dive into all those different stories. But what I do like to ask all my guests, Anton, is 
happy hustle hacks for each of these different disciplines, these different areas of their life. And let's start with health, because I know you being a, you know, a, a football player and, yeah. and really, you know, playing at that high level, health's a priority. So yeah. I'm curious, you know, do you have a tip, a tool, a tactic? I like to call them happy hustle hacks for health that you can share with the, the hustlers out there, the happy hustlers? Yeah. So, um, I call it five before nine, five before nine. So I walk five miles a day before 9 a.m. Oh, wow. Uh, my doctor told me don't run. There's no need to run unless I'm trying to run a marathon. But yeah, a vigorous walk. Um, and I walk five miles every day before 9 a.m. And, um, and it's, it takes you about an hour and 20, 25 minutes at a decent pace to walk uh, basically five miles. And mm. that's my happy hustler hack. And I'm going to tell you what it's done for me. I've lost 40 pounds in 12 months wow. because Good I walk you, five miles a day. Mm. Um, I do another thing, I intermittent fast, which is something people have been yep. doing for a long time. But I really believe that five miles a day is my happy hustle hack. If you can do five before nine, you've knocked your 10,000 steps out of the way and whatever else you do during the day is gravy, bro. Yeah, that's already a win. I love that. Super practical. And, you know, and you're, you're not a small man. So for, uh, you know, for you, like, getting out there, getting after it. I mean, I would have, I got to go watch some old game tape of you play ball, man. <laughs> I was now pre digital age, so it's hard to find video. I know, I know. I bet. Well, let's talk about money. You know, I think money is important subject to discuss. And, and yeah. for me, I look at it as a frequency, you know, it's a tool. It's um, it's a way to reveal more of who you truly are. Mm -hmm. I, I like to ask, you know, a happy hustle like in regards to money, maybe something Anton does that helps him save or invest or spend wisely that he can share. Yeah. So, uh, so I will tell you, um, I married well, uh, I married a, a woman who grew up in a real estate family. My wife got a real estate license while she was in college. Okay. Oh, wow. So people don't do that. No. And my mother has been an entrepreneur for 35 years. And so my wow. mother-in-law, her name is Nancy Johnson. She's wrote, written a book called a million dollar producer. Mm. And I listened to them about real estate investment. So my mm. wife and I were married six months before we had our first investment property. And then within two years, we had a, a total of 12 units. And so, oh, wow. so I, I learned that, you know, most millionaires and folks that are wealthy, we love to think that they made all of their money from other things, but a large portion of them own like 37% of their portfolio is real estate. Mm. And so, so for me, my, my money game is not in the stock market. I mean, I do do it like everybody else does, mm -hmm. but uh, land and, and rental property, investment property um, are the ways that, that we go about it. So my happy hustle hack is for people to, to figure out how to in, invest and buy property. I mean, right now, the market is kind of crazy. If you got property, yeah. you can sell it, but um, always look for a deal. There's a way to get a deal somewhere. And so I focus on real estate. Yeah. Love that, man. Great, great, happy hustle hack there. And, um, you know, one in which even with a volatile market or the ups and downs, the interest rates are so low and it, it's really something all the happy hustlers, you know, should be diligent in their, in their research, but take advantage of. Um, yes, sir. So I love that you went there. Let's talk about spirituality, you know, yes. I'm not necessarily one God or another. I don't care what you believe in. I just care that you believe, you know, for yes, me, it's yes. about, you know, having faith and, and yes. believing in a higher power and connecting to source energy and, you know, just something more than myself. Yeah. What about you? What's a happy hustle hack in regards to spirituality? Yeah. So um, I, I'm, I'm very much a, a believer um, in, you know, I'm a Christian and have been um, my entire life. I grew up Catholic, um, but in terms of context around spirituality, um, I do something um, every day and, and that's, you know, pray. But uh, twice a year, I do mm. what I call a 30 day mental fast. Mm. So for 30 days, no social media, no television, no newspapers, no magazines. Oh, wow. Um, I, I, I just tune it all out. And for 30 days, I, I take a 20 minute walk where I just really breathe in and breathe out to absorb nature around me. Um, I listen to audio books, positive audio books. I read from an inspiring or powering book. And every night I spend 45 minutes doing what I call prayer, reflection, and visualization. Mm. So I pray and, and, I, and I ask God for, 
for him to manifest in my life and show up the way that he wants me, me to. I reflect and say thank you for all the things that he has given me, all of the good things, all of the bad things, all the adversity. I thank mm. him for everything. And then I visualize where do I want to be 10 years from now? Mm. I don't visualize tomorrow or next week or next year, but a decade from that moment, what do I want my life to be like? Mm. And the reason why I do that every day, because in that 30 day period, I get a detailed mental picture of the desired future that I want for myself. Mm. And I can tell you right now that I've been doing this for 20 years in terms of that prayer reflection and visualization. There's some things that I wrote down in 2000 and 2001 that I manifested in 2010 and 2011. Wow. Like literally, in, in, it's, it's almost like uh, what I call it mental GPS. Mm -hmm. you, you put in the end destination of where you want to be. And because you've typed it in and you talked about it and you visualize what that end destination is, you map back a direct path to where you are right now. Mm. So you don't make many mistakes on that road to get into that end point because the GPS is accurate because it starts at the end and works its way back. It doesn't start from where you are to get to the end point. And so I've been doing that. And, and I just thank God for, for giving me the, the focus and the clarity to tune out of everything and really get into myself, uh, into him every 30 days. Mm, dude, that's powerful. Uh, I mean, I have not heard that. And I think it's something I definitely want to try, you know, 30 days, basically doing a full detox of yeah. outside information. Right. Oh, and just, brother. yeah, I bet. I bet. Oh. <laughs> it is. You gotta, you gotta I mean, automate all of those emails and you gotta automate all your social. And like, I literally <laughs> log out of every platform wow. out of every device for 30 days. Wow. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So no work, like no phone calls or yeah. So, I do phone phone, calls? So, so let me be clear. You can take okay. phone calls, okay. Um, phone calls and emails. You can take both of those, but it's the social stuff. It's the okay, okay. social media accounts It's the, you know, YouTube It's logging yep, out yep, all yep. of those things. And the one thing I want to be clear, uh, it's, it's two things that one is draining of you. So we all have people in our lives that are close to us that don't give us positive energy. They actually suck energy out of us. Every energy day. vampires. Yeah. The, the cousin who always calls needing to borrow yeah. money, you yeah. know, the, the sibling who always has some drama in their life or the best friend who's always calling you with some awful story about what relationship they're in. Yeah. These people suck us to death. Right. So I don't respond to their messages for 30 days. I don't even look at the If their texts come in, I don't even answer it for 30 days. Mm. But instead, I replace it with inspiring and empowering people who motivate me and lift me up. Mm. And so I literally will, you know, find those five friends who are like the super cheerleaders in my life who people like you, bro, <laughs> who's going to add value. And so you try to find a way to spend time with them and talk to the mm. people who pour into you mm. over the 30 days and yeah. you tune out the negative people. But mm. other than that, it's really just cutting out the newspapers and magazines and 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 so, the social. Yep. Yeah. The social is 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 the toughest. And I will tell you, this past summer when I did the 30 day mental fast, it was almost impossible because you're in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. You put it in the hurricane season. I mean, everything is changing every five yeah. minutes on the news. It gets really, really hard. But here's where everybody can be okay with it. If you turn off the news and get out of the social media stuff, if something really is going wrong in the world the person closest to you that you trust and you love, they will call and tell you what you need. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about missing anything. If it's something really important, the yeah. people you care about will tell you what you need. But everybody else, they can wait 30 days. Yeah, no, it's so true, man. And, you know, it, it kind of brings me to the Montana mastermind that I'm, I'm going to try to get you on, uh, eventually, man. I know you don't do camping, but five days, digital detox, you know, camping out in the wilderness, like just, I, you don't feel that type of liberation anywhere else, you know, like a complete freedom away from tech, away from the, the grid, no power, no running water. I mean, you got wow. the river, but wow. like, that's, that's where I reset, you know, and um, we're going to get you out here one of these years. I, 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 man, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I got the mental part of that down already. I know you do. That, that physical part of being in the woods and in, in nature. Bears. 
a little bit over the edge with me right now. I know. I'll, I'll have to keep working on it. Keep working. Anyway, on man, I wanted to. I want to run through the rapid fire round with you, and sure. and then just wrap this bad boy up. It's been an amazing interview, man. I just really appreciate you. Thank um, you. this is basically where I just ask you random questions, and you just answer honestly. First thing that comes to mind. Are sure. you ready? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> Favorite food? Go. French fries. Favorite movie? Uh, Pulp Fiction. Favorite book? Um, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. What's your spirit animal? My spirit animal is a panther, Black Panther. Ooh, I like it. Best business advice? Best business advice is to invest more than you spend. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> if you could have one superpower, what would it be? It would be to fly. If you had one billboard for the world to see, and this was your last piece of content, what would that billboard read? There's never a wrong time to do the right thing. Mm, love it. Three things you're most grateful for. I'm most grateful for my family, my wife and my daughter. I'm most grateful for my health. And I'm most grateful to be the son of a Navy veteran and a fourth generation brat of three other veterans in the generation before him. Mm, love that, man. You crushed that rapid fire round, Anton. Where can people go to find out more about you? Let them, let them know again, those links. And uh, yeah. yeah. Everybody go to AntonGun.com. That's my <laughs> homepage. And on all social panels, Anton J. Gunn. You can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Amazing. Anton, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge you, brother. This has been amazing. I really am so grateful we connected. I appreciate you sharing your love, your light, your wisdom with us and, and myself and the Happy Hustlers. I mean, your stories, like the, the insider knowledge with Obama and all these other amazing greats, it's really beautiful to see. And then just to hear your body of work and like how passionate you are about it and how important it is you know especially now in this in this day and age it's like it's so important that work so i just you know i tip the hat to you man and I, i'm just grateful we connected so thank, thank you Terry. i appreciate your brother i mean you can consider me a friend for life man oh you're yeah a great guy i'm inspired by you as well and you are improving my life every day uh with this happy hustle framework man I, it just was mind-blowing to me so glad to share a stage with you yeah, brother. I appreciate that. And I'm going to have to send you, you know, I'll send you my book and my, my fridge magnet too, so we can get you the whole, the whole shebang set up. But any final words to the happy hustlers out there before we say goodbye? Um, um, in the immortal words of Rick Ross, and I'm a hip hop head, and all the happy hustlers every day, you need to be hustling, but oh. hustle in full happiness. That's my last uh, words. Yeah. Well, I do want to ask you the last question now. What does happy hustling mean to you? It means um, living on purpose. It, it really does mean um, doing what you're passionate about and what you're good at in order to make a difference in the world. And that's what a happy hustler is. Mm, mic drop. Anton Gunn, everyone. Thanks for watching and listening, y'all. We're out. Peace and love.